Okay. So I am very fortunate that we have Kyle Matchell from Mark with us tonight. Those of you that have been on our calls before, um, Sarah Shirk over at Mark has been helping uh, put these calls together and she has got some different job duties now. And so we are very thankful that Kyle um, is at the table and able to help us tonight. So Kyle, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. And Kyle, um, just, yeah, just in, it looks like it's in the, um, presentation mode again, rather than full screen of the slide. So we did practice this earlier and had it practice this. I've already forgotten it. Um, was it display settings? I think it was. So go ahead and go from beginning again, Kyle. And then, um, yeah. Oh, there we go. There we go. Is that Let's it? see if that, I think yes. That, yes. Wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you for bearing with me. No, no big deal. Um, Jenny. Okay. Yes. So that you know, if you, just in case you're not, or that you're new to Zoom, if you can't see the slides, there's a little bar in the middle. You can pull it over and make it bigger. Sometimes we get reviews that say I couldn't see it. Gotcha. All right. Thank you very much. And one more time, if you are just joining us, um, go ahead and sign in in the chat at the bottom of your screen where it says chat. You should be able to type in there. That way we can remember who all was here tonight. So good evening formally and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Jenny Brandt. I am the director of our Early Care and Education Hub at the Family Conservancy. And I'm also representing our Early Childhood Task Force. And we have been working very hard throughout the pandemic uh, for you all. Um, our goal has been to be your all's voice. And um, I think Kyle, we've got a slide here. Yes, of our, of our partners that we have on this task force. And it, we just couldn't do any of this without the help of everyone. And it's very, uh, it's a very unique group because we all work with early care and education providers in a slightly different capacity, but we all very much have been sharing the same goal to help really try to figure out what your needs are and then help you find resources to meet those needs. Um, so these community meetings are one way that um, we can help make that happen. Um, so tonight we are going to bring another hot topic going on in our community. Um, it won't be that the Chiefs are going to the Super Bowl, although that would be really fun. Um, it's going to be vaccinations. Um, so I'm sure all of you can attest to this is like daily conversation. Um, vaccinations. Should I get one? Can I get one? Where do I get one? What is the deal after I get one? Um, there's just so many questions that we really wanted an opportunity for you all to be able to hear the same information all together um, and hopefully get some of your questions answered. So that's our goal for tonight. And we're really fortunate that we have one of our own task force members, Dan Manley, uh, with the Lee Summit uh, Fire Department that's going to speak on vaccinations tonight. And we're very thankful that he's willing to do that for all of us. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to him in a minute. But first, you know, we've done several of these community meetings now, and um, the format is going to be a little bit different tonight. So I just want to do a quick overview of what that's going to look like. Um, so first, Dan is going to provide information, and he's got slides to go along with that. Um, and then when he's done, he, we're going to give you all the opportunity to put questions that still remain for you in the chat. Um, so hopefully some of your questions are answered by the information that Dan shares. But we realized that it was silly to assume that we would know what all questions you had and we wanted to really utilize this opportunity to hear your all's voices of what else you need to know about this or what we didn't cover. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that summarized chat and we're going to create a frequently asked questions and we're going to put it all together in a document. And I would like to say shortly, I mean, we're going to work as fast as we can to get that back out. I don't have a promise on that, but soon. Um, and so if you registered for this meeting tonight, we will be sending that out to you. Um, and we're also going to have that available on our website. Um, so know that that's going to be available and that truly is the goal. So instead of longer, tonight it's just going to be one hour. There will not be breakout rooms. Um, and then after Dan has talked and you have put your question in the chat, we're not attempting to do live Q&A. So once you've done that, you are very welcome to hop off um, of there when you are ready. Um, so please, please, uh, whatever questions you have, make sure you just get them in the chat. And um, thank you for coming tonight. I know it's a Monday night and I mean, I need to go to bed. I only got three hours of sleep from that Chiefs game. I was so wound up. Um, so thanks for showing up tonight. And Dan Manley, are you ready to get started tonight? Yes, I am. Thank you, Jen. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Dan Manley. I'm an assistant chief with the Lee Summit Fire Department. Uh, but one of the reasons I'm engaged in this conversation this evening is that I serve in a role uh, that uh, we have in the region called a multi-agency coordination system. And for our region, that covers a, uh, uh, an area of nine counties and 140 municipalities in the region that were uh, convened to help provide coordination of effort uh, in response to the COVID pandemic that we've been dealing with uh, uh, since uh, February of last year. Uh, the, uh, or the activity and efforts of our regional coordination group uh, look at all aspects of the response in the region. And uh, it's not to take over uh, the response activities within the jurisdiction. Again, it's to be able to identify points of coordination where we can work together. Uh, so we have a Missouri uh, chief for the system and a Kansas chief because of our bi-state community. And uh, we work together just to be able to erase that state line because we know that uh, these activities are going to be supporting our entire region and that pandemic doesn't have a geographical boundary that it complies with. So that being said, we'll transition to the next slide, please. When we talk about the COVID vaccine planning and coordination, uh, it's good to recognize that really the effort to begin development of a vaccine uh, began back in May of 2020. Uh, you've heard the, the name of the effort called Operation Warp Speed, and that's where the United States had convened science and uh, the pharma industry to be able to work on development of a vaccine that could uh, help eradicate the COVID virus. In addition to that, it was uh, developing supply chain to help support that vaccination effort as we're moving forward. Uh, in August of 2020, uh, national and state planning uh, efforts occurred developing uh, distribution plans so that once the vaccine was made available, they could work on the supply chain and logistics to deploy those resources. Uh, there was direction that came out that the states had to develop a plan to be approved uh, by the end of uh, October of 2020. So in the state of Missouri uh, at that time, there was a uh, regional vaccination planning or excuse me, a state uh, planning work group that was established that uh, was made up of uh, both uh, state partners and then external partners throughout the state of Missouri. In Kansas, they took a little different approach. They were using uh, department interdepartmental agencies within the state of Kansas to develop that uh, distribution plan. Uh, and then they were going to work to spread that uh, communication or that uh, educate on that plan externally once the plan was finalized. In September of 2020, we formed a bi-state uh, regional vaccination work group, recognizing that once the state plans were approved, we were going to have to be prepared as a region to be able to support uh, implementation or operation 
uh, of the, the state plans once they had been approved. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that process and the work of our uh, vaccine work group uh, in a few moments. Uh, the uh, CDC uh, published a uh, interim playbook for jurisdictions. And when we talk about jurisdictions with the vaccination program, uh, the federal government reviews, uh, or excuse me, uh, defines jurisdictions as states and territories. Uh, so they provided that state guidance in September of 2020. Our state plans were formalized and approved late October, early November of 2020. CDC review, reviewed all the plans and then they made recommendations for changes to be able to align those plans with the federal efforts on the distribution. Uh, in 2000, or excuse me, October of 2020, the key aspect of our uh, vaccination program was established. That's when both the state of Missouri and the state of Kansas uh, began enrolling vaccine providers within the states. Uh, and that's really key because for us to be able to uh, have a vaccination program, we have to be able to have systems in place and programs where vaccinators are able to administer the vaccine. And we'll go into greater detail in the presentation on that. Uh, at that time, uh, once the uh, plans were approved, we started enrolling vaccinators. Then we began our regional implementation of the vaccination effort. Next slide, please. So to be able to uh, look at the significance of this, we were able to uh, go from May to December 14th of uh, the same year to have two vaccines that were identified, uh, developed, designed, manufactured to be effective in responding to uh, the protection against COVID-19. Uh, and so to give you an idea, once the vaccines go through the process of being manufactured, the science goes through uh, a variety of testing to make sure that the vaccine is safe. They've got to go through clinical trials to be able to get that analysis completed. Then they have to submit for an emergency use authorization to the FDA. The FDA releases the information uh, to a uh, a committee called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And so as we uh, saw the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine completing their clinical trials, they had convened the committee called ACIP to be able to review the information and make recommendations on how the vaccines can be implemented or used uh, in uh, our society. Uh, they could either uh, make recommendations, they could go ahead and uh, approve, or they could deny uh, the application based on the information that they have uh, the or that they reviewed in the clinical data. Uh, once the vaccines are approved, they become available for order and distribution uh, in the states. So recognizing that seven months, we were able to develop the two vaccines, they were gonna be in limited availability and it was a planning assumption that it was gonna take time for that uh, inventory to expand through our manufacturing processes. We were able to uh, begin ordering the vaccine in December of 2020. Next slide, please. So this kind of shows the uh, process of uh, being able to uh, see what's involved in that seventh month period, each of the stages and phases that they had conducted the clinical involvement or uh, uh, clinical evaluation of the vaccine and its use. Um, the uh, vaccine as it's being developed in the trials were primarily for adult populations. And so as we uh, look at the vaccines that we have available, uh, most of them have not undergone uh, clinical trials for pediatric populations before the emergency use authorization was established. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine that we'll talk about, it was uh, in the emergency use authorization able to be used in populations 16 and older. However, the Moderna vaccine are for populations 18 and older. Um, right now, uh, they're uh, extending 
clinical trials to be able to uh, evaluate in a younger pediatric population. Uh, and they're expecting that uh, some of those trials will be completed and we'll see modification of the emergency use authorizations probably in the early spring. So it's something to be able to look forward to. But uh, as they go through that clinical development, the uh, regulatory review is that part that ACIP makes their recommendations upon. And they're evaluating manufacturing and quality controls as a part of their process, specific to reporting side effects that occur uh, during the vaccine development. And what you'll hear is uh, uh, that a majority of the side effects that are identified with both of the vaccines are uh, the uh, basically a uh, soreness to the arm where the vaccine is administered. Uh, after uh, the vaccine is administered, sometimes people can experience uh, some generalized aches and pains, maybe feeling a little fatigue. Sometimes a fever uh, is associated with uh, the vaccine administration. Usually those symptoms are resolved within a 24 to 48 hour window after the vaccine is administered. However, there are occasions where there are some uh, reactions uh, to the, the vaccine administration. Uh, what you have heard about on the news is there's discussions on the uh, uh, allergic reactions or anaphylactic reactions that have occurred with the uh, vaccine administration. These are very rare uh, and they uh, are not isolated just to this vaccination effort. They're common uh, as far as being rare, but occurring with other uh, vaccines that are administered in our society. Um, when you uh, look at each of the vaccines, the CDC has established as a part of the emergency use authorization, the specific criteria about uh, indications and contraindications with the vaccine. And so I would encourage you as you're doing your uh, uh, consideration of the vaccine uh, and whether or not you're going to receive the vaccine or your family is going to receive the vaccine to be able to go to those websites that we'll share with you to be able to uh, gather and review that information. Um, there are many things that uh, involve whether or not uh, uh, a person has had uh, COVID in the past. Uh, there's uh, a lot of questions uh, that are being answered as far as uh, the uh, administration of the COVID vaccine with other vaccines. Typically, they uh, like to maintain a window uh, about uh, the uh, vaccine uh, being independent of other vaccines for at least a two week period. Sometimes they extend it depending on the type of vaccine uh, that uh, people are considering receiving. But you can gather that information again from an FAQ section that both the CDC and the state of Missouri and the state of Kansas have on their websites. There's also questions about uh, whether or not uh, they're safe for administration in pregnancy. Uh, there is limited information av available. Uh, the CDC guidance is uh, to be able to follow up with your primary care provider uh, to discuss the vaccination effort. Uh, but in absence of the uh, uh, clinical trial information, there's still uh, an indication that uh, it would be important to consider the vaccination uh, in pregnancy just because of the benefit versus the risk of the uh, COVID virus. Um, if we could go ahead and transition to the next slide, please. This is providing some additional detail about the uh, two vaccines that are currently available. The Pfizer vaccine, which is the one that requires ultra cold storage. Uh, so it has more uh, challenges uh, when you look at being able to maintain and store the inventory if you're a vaccine provider. Uh, it received its emergency use authorization on uh, December 11th, uh, 2020. Uh, both vaccines are what they call uh, messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, they uh, 
or synthetic vaccines that uh, help to uh, basically trick the virus and uh, uh, the response to uh, be able to uh, develop antibodies to uh, fight the, the virus. Uh, the both vaccines require two doses. The Pfizer vaccine requires a uh, second dose at a 21 day interval and the Moderna uh, can be uh, the booster doses administered at 28 days. Because of the discussion on vaccine uh, availability, there's been discussion about whether or not there could be a delay uh, in receiving the second dose. Uh, or if they could change the dose and possibly uh, provide half dose for the booster dose at that second uh, interval. And the science and the emergency use authorizations both uh, for both vaccines recommend that we go ahead and stay with the recommendations of the emergency use authorization and not alter. However, there is a grace period that's allowed uh, with the uh, vaccines uh, and it's a four day interval that is uh, recommended, uh, nothing to exceed that four day window. However, uh, as the science uh, is being uh, further developed on the topic, there's been discussion that it could extend to a possible uh, 40 day window, uh, but that information will probably become more uh, more discussed or greater, have greater discussion as uh, we uh, progress uh, in looking at the vaccination efforts. The Pfizer vaccine, as I mentioned earlier, is approved for those over the age of 18. Moderna is 18 and above. The, the next is the efficacy of the vaccines. Uh, when you look at efficacy, this is how effective the virus, or excuse me, the vaccine is at uh, uh, mitigating the uh, uh, the effects of the virus itself or controlling or containing the virus. The Pfizer uh, virus has a 94% uh, or excuse me, vaccine has a 94% efficacy and the Moderna around 95%. So these are both highly effective uh, vaccines. Uh, when you uh, look at the influenza vaccine that we use, typically the efficacy on those vaccines are around 55%. So this is a big difference uh, in uh, uh, the efficacy for the vaccine for this virus. Uh, and th this is new because of the messenger RNA virus. It's a newer technology that uh, has proven to be uh, have a greater effectiveness uh, as we're looking at the information from the clinical trials. So next slide, please. These are some links that uh, you uh, will have available to you uh, from tonight's presentation. The information on here shows the federal interim playbook that provides guidance that the states were using in developing their plans. And then you also have the link for the state of Kansas's plan and the state of Missouri's plan. The CDC has a link where you can actually see the plans for all of the 50 states and then the territories uh, in our country. So if you're looking for something to be able to compare from one state to another, that's a good source to be able to evaluate. Next slide, please. So this slide is just to show the, the phases uh, that were a part of the, the federal and state rollout. Uh, originally, they uh, divided the uh, distribution of vaccine into three phases. The phases that we were focusing on for planning will be uh, phase one and phase two. And in this, what they are looking at and the planning assumptions is that we will continue to see uh, increase in vaccine inventory as we're moving through the phases. The original, the first phase, the 1A, as you're seeing here on the slide, it was primarily designed to uh, reduce the risk of morbidity and mortality. So the people that had the highest risk were identified as the elderly, focusing on the long-term care facilities and the healthcare providers that were patient-facing, providing support, not only in the long-term care facilities, but into the hospitals and uh, uh, clinics across our communities. 
as we progressed to phase B, uh, 1B, that was dealing with uh, support for uh, critical infrastructure, uh, the uh, public safety in our communities, uh, looking at uh, child care providers and uh, uh, educational uh, institutions. And then as we get into the 1C, it's dealing with other uh, critical infrastructure and community based on the uh, Critical Infrastructure, CISA, uh, which is a federal program that uh, breaks down the different sectors of uh, our industry and identifies those that are critical for community uh, function. Phase two uh, starts to look at other higher risk populations uh, within our communities. The one thing that I didn't mention in 1B and 1C is they were inclusive of those people greater than 65 years of age and those people 18 to 65 that uh, have comorbidities or uh, health conditions that put them at greater risk uh, because of COVID exposure. Uh, phase three uh, transitions from those other critical populations and then provides vaccination for the general population. As we look at the timelines uh, through this uh, phased process or approach, uh, we anticipated that we would be uh, providing infrastructure, or I'm sorry, vaccine to our uh, our critical infrastructure and uh, the child care providers, our uh, educational institutions and other programs by the time we entered February. And so we're following that timeline as we are moving forward. We think that we'll be expanding into the, the other populations probably into June uh, before there would be vaccine available to help have a greater expansion of that capability. Uh, so if we could transition to the next slide, please. So vaccine providers, these are critical uh, for us to have success. Uh, to be able to receive vaccine, uh, a vaccine provider has to enroll with the state. The state has to be able to review their application. They have to determine that the provider has all the uh, requirements to be able to uh, receive, maintain, store, and then administer vaccine uh, for the different phases that they've been approved to provide service. And so what you can see is a list of the providers that uh, are included in our enrollment program uh, and who have been administering vaccine uh, within our communities. Primarily with the 1A and 1B uh, vaccination effort, it's been hospitals, local public health jurisdictions, the uh, federally qualified health centers, and then some retail pharmacies. Uh, when we talk about the uh, long-term care facilities and the uh, staff that uh, provide uh, support in those facilities, those institutions are being vaccinated through something called the Federal Pharmacy Program. The Federal Pharmacy Program was uh, vaccinated, or excuse me, Federal Pharmacy Program was a partnership between three different organizations, CVS, Walgreens, and Managed Healthcare Association. So the states then worked uh, with the federal government to prepare or present the information to the long-term care facilities. They selected which vendor was going to uh, help provide the vaccine to their residents and staff. And then they scheduled appointments at those facilities. Uh, most of the long-term care facilities across the states have already received their first dose of vaccination for their residents and staff, and they're scheduling their second dose at this time. The other uh, populations being served are being taken care of through the hospitals and the local public health agencies. As we move through these new phases, then what will happen is the healthcare systems, which will include uh, physician offices, uh, the medical office buildings, could be retail pharmacies or independent pharmacies in your community that would be available to provide vaccine for you and your staff. Uh, or your families. Uh, 
Uh, there are also mobile vaccinators that uh, are uh, available, such as Heart to Heart International, uh, the Medical Reserve Corps in our region. These are all organizations that have set up teams to help provide vaccine or vaccine administration services in our region. The um, the important part of this process is that just because a provider has been approved in, uh, as a vaccine provider in the state doesn't necessarily mean they have vaccine available to them. And that's our biggest challenge right now is that we have uh, several providers that are available to administer vaccine. But the problem is, is that there's inadequate capacity of vaccine in the community for all of them to receive the vaccine. So that's caused our uh, timeline to be able to vaccinate the different phases in our groups uh, to be longer uh, and while we're waiting on that supply chain to improve. Next slide, please. So the, the big question is how can I get vaccine? How can I sign up? And the challenge is because of that limited supply, we know that uh, there are different groups uh, or different uh, providers that are gonna target vaccinating different groups. Local public health agencies in our region have established uh, uh, surveys to which you can go and sign up for uh, that ask you information that allows them to uh, help sort uh, the population as they respond to the survey so they can identify what phase uh, you would be eligible to receive the vaccine. Um, and then what they do is they send out communications to be able to help give you awareness about your status in the process. That uh, communication, once vaccine is available, they transition to sending you a, uh, a link to register or schedule a time to receive the vaccine. And not only, uh, I guess, the local public health agencies aren't the only providers that are going to be uh, providing that service uh, in our community. Another example could be your primary care physician. If you uh, reach out to them, they can give you some idea as to their status and when they would be expecting to receive the vaccine in their office or larger healthcare systems that are uh, vaccine providers uh, will send out communications to provide that update as to their system status and when they will be uh, having vaccine available. Similar to the local public health agencies, they have that registration process or have a mechanism uh, to be able to inform their patients as to when that vaccine uh, will be available and give you an opportunity to schedule a time to receive the vaccine. The other group is that uh, retail pharmacy group. Uh, when you look at the uh, uh, CVS, Walgreen, Hy-Vee, Walmarts, Costco's, those pharmacies uh, also uh, have mechanisms to communicate with the people that use their services to be able to let them know about availability of vaccine and the uh, process to be able to schedule. So it's important for you to have awareness about who the providers are in your community, and then also to have a plan uh, to stay informed and to make sure that you've registered with those providers uh, so that when it's your opportunity to receive the vaccine, that you don't miss that opportunity. Uh, as we progress through these different phases of vaccine uh, administration, once your phase has uh, been activated to make you eligible to receive the vaccine, any subsequent vaccine, you're still eligible to receive the vaccine. So what I'm trying to say is if you are in the 1A population and you don't get the vaccine during the 1A phase, you can receive that vaccination in the 1B, 1C, phase two, phase three, any of those uh, points in the process. There's also a question about uh, the, for local public health registrations, if uh, what's the criteria they use to be able to uh, determine whether or not they can vaccinate you. Most of the local public health agencies across the region use the practice that if you live or work within that public health jurisdiction, they can provide that vaccination to you uh, within their clinics. Uh, when you talk about some of the other programs, uh, you have the ability to uh, be able to uh, uh, get your vaccine in other areas. So some, some 
providers don't have the uh, jurisdictional requirement that you would see with the local public health agency uh, as they're uh, doing their vaccination effort. So it's important to uh, follow up with the provider and see what their criteria is. Typically, if you complete the survey, they will let you know whether or not you're eligible to receive the vaccine in that jurisdiction. So the uh, best way to be able to do that is to go to the local public health department's website to view their criteria or to the vaccine provider if you're talking about a retail pharmacy um, being able to go to the Walgreen website, CVS, and, and whatever. Uh, any of those sites will provide information. Um, when you look at the vaccine administration, because the federal government paid for the vaccine, uh, there's not a cost to the vaccine itself. It's been paid for federally. The uh, services or the agencies that administer the vaccine can uh, charge a fee for administration of the vaccine. Typically that's covered by the uh, insurance provider. And when you, uh, the insurance provider uh, has a mechanism to be able to cover that across the different types of uh, uh, providers. So there's not, uh, everybody should be covered in that process. For people that are uninsured, there's also a mechanism to be able to cover the cost for that vaccine administration. So, uh, so there shouldn't be any cost to anybody for uh, receiving the vaccine uh, as uh, it becomes available. Next slide, please. So wanted to show you the coordination effort across the, the region. Uh, because everything's moving at such a quick pace, uh, there's uh, a lot of activity going on. So an effort to try and coordinate our response activities and to be more efficient. These are the partner organizations that we work with. Uh, and so these are inter interdisciplinary committees that are both public and private and we work to identify uh, the prioritization or phases across the region, making sure that we can align vaccinators with the different populations to be uh, served, be able to look at our communication and public information, which is very challenging with a uh, uh, dynamic environment as the policies change in both states regularly. We look at our logistics to be able to support and the logistics is looking at our facilities, our staffing and our supplies and resources to vaccinate. Technology, which becomes incredibly important because of all the components with tracking the, the vaccine, being able to monitor adverse reactions, looking at uh, second appointments and other activities uh, related to the technology. Also to be able to track uh, what uh, we've been able to distribute and administer across the region. The last group uh, that we work with is our legal and advocacy. Uh, because this is such a new process uh, and the policies have been changing both at the federal and the state level, we work to identify ways that we can advocate with uh, uh, governments to be able to help improve our equity and access to the vaccine in the region, ways to be able to improve our uh, communication and distribution uh, and time to react uh, as a part of the process. So next slide, please. Some more uh, resources that'll be uh, in the uh, information shared with you. These are the uh, links to the Operation Warp Speed site the CDC site, which provides great detail about any question that you would have as far as the distribution efforts, uh, the Kansas vaccine website and the Missouri vaccine website. Uh, the websites are very well coordinated. They have a lot of information for both the residents in our states, the, uh, the vaccinators, and then also, again, having uh, information about the clinical trials and the details about the vaccine. So they uh, both have frequently asked question sites that are set up to be able to help provide information that uh, you may be curious about. We also have within our region the uh, preparemetrokc.org. This is a website managed by our local emergency managers. And we have a variety of different tools on there to help you 
have uh, information about COVID response and we have a regional hub that gives you data about COVID related uh, activity in the metropolitan area and it's broken down by jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So our current activities within the vaccine work group, we have uh, five, five microcells that we work with. Uh, we have uh, participants on the state uh, vaccination work groups, but our focus again is to be able to look at approved vaccinators. The challenge we have in the region is that we're working to make sure that there's transparency in the list of vaccinators so that you and your organization and your uh, households can identify the vaccinators that are available in the region so that you can uh, make sure that you stay informed about the opportunity to receive the vaccine. One of our other challenges is being able to communicate uh, with vulnerable populations and ensure that they have equity and access to the vaccination efforts. Uh, we work with the federally qualified health centers and uh, different organizations that we consider influencer, uh, influence organizations for these vulnerable populations to help make sure that they have uh, access um, to the vaccine uh, and the services to administer the vaccine to those populations. The last thing uh, that I'll mention on our uh, regional work is the communications effort, just because uh, there's a lot of miscommunication and rumor control that has to be done. We're very focused on making sure that uh, we communicate about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine, safety practices, and then also to encourage patients while we're waiting for adequate uh, supply of vaccine to become available. Sometimes there's a fear of missing out in our society and we wanna make sure that everybody understands that it may take us a little bit longer, but everybody that wants to receive vaccine will have an opportunity to receive the vaccine. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the challenges and constraints as we've talked about through this presentation is availability of the vaccine is, is one of our challenges. Uh, we know that uh, the state of Missouri has been receiving around uh, 67,000 doses of vaccine a week. Uh, the state of Kansas has been receiving about 35,000 doses of vaccine a week. So when you look at the populations of both states, it's gonna take us a while at that level uh, to be able to uh, vaccinate our entire state uh, to get that herd immunity that we've talked about or heard of. The, uh, the important thing to remember is that we've got other vaccines that are in the supply chain uh, that are coming up for approval here in the next probably six weeks. Uh, one of those is from Johnson & Johnson. The other one is from AstraZeneca. That'll add two more vaccines to our supply chain and will increase our ability uh, to broaden our efforts to uh, vaccinate our uh, population. Uh, we're also, again, I mentioned the challenge of getting access to some of the information on our vaccinators, but one of the other challenges we're having is that public health has been focused on testing and tracing uh, different cases with respect to the COVID uh, activity. And so sometimes that creates limitations in our staffing available to support mass vaccination efforts. We've been working within the region to be able to identify ways to share resources and expand our ability to do more vast vaccination activity. But it's again, dependent on staffing and then the availability of um, vaccine. Uh, one of the other challenges is our communications to vulnerable populations because of limited access to technology. So we're looking at ways to be able to work with organizations to minimize gaps or impact uh, as far as communicating with those groups that could lead us to doing some polling or uh, working with some associations to help uh, sign up uh, vulnerable populations for appointments as we're moving through uh, the vaccination efforts. Uh, anytime we go through a process, uh, somebody um, tries to have some nefarious uh, uh, intent, we start to see cyber crimes occurring. Uh, there's concerns about uh, uh, different activities uh, occurring that may uh, uh, put people at greater risk. So we wanna make sure that we use trusted sources of information 
uh, in our communities and we want to be able to validate it. So that's where if you're unsure of uh, a vendor or some information that you've received uh, with respect to the vaccination effort, we would like to encourage you to reach out to your local or state health departments to be able to verify or validate information. The, the last bullet that I have here is the probably one of our greatest challenges here in the bi-state area. We have uh, differing plans and phases across the states. Um, and we'll touch on that here in just a moment, but the state of Kansas shifted from the one A, B, and C uh, to a five-phase system, uh, which uh, eliminated some of the other uh, languages. However, the state of Missouri is still using the 1A, uh, 1B, Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3, and then Phase 2 and Phase 3. So that can create some challenges when we start to communicate uh, about uh, opportunities within the bi-state region. Next slide, please. So this graphic is just showing the difference of the phases, and really it simplifies it at the very top that during phase one, uh, limited doses are available and it's to, the, uh, to be uh, provided to those at highest risk. Phase two, we have a larger number of uh, doses available and so we're able to expand uh, to be able to meet some of the other sections that are critical for the functions in our community. And as we get into the phase three, the vaccine is broadly available and so then it can be provided to the general population as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. So I just mentioned the state of Kansas uh, last week uh, announced, or two weeks ago, announced the five-phase uh, recommendation. And so phase one was the uh, phase that the state of Kansas was in until this week. They transitioned to phase two. So you can see that under phase two, it identifies persons 65 or older, those individuals in congregate settings, and then high contact critical workers. So in the state of Kansas, this uh, includes all child care providers and the uh, uh, education uh, institutions within the state. Uh, and then all unvaccinated personnel uh, or persons from the previous phase. Uh, the next phase, phase three, transitions to the age 16 to 64 with severe medical risk, other critical workers and unvaccinated uh, populations from the previous phases. You can see that as we move forward, the phases uh, increase the uh, populations to be vaccinated, but they're uh, on the bottom of the table here, it shows that they're anticipating the transition to phase three uh, in March as we go into phase four, uh, late April, mid-May, and then uh, phase five in June. The one thing that's different between the Missouri and Kansas plans is that Missouri providers uh, under the current phase uh, don't uh, are not eligible to receive uh, vaccine until the state of Missouri goes into the 1B tier three phase, and I'll share that in just a moment. If we could change slides, please. So here's a copy of the Missouri uh, vaccination plan. Uh, and what you can see is phase one identified all the healthcare workers that we were discussing earlier in the patients in those high risk facilities. Tier one on 1B address first responders, emergency services, and public health infrastructure uh, in communities. Tier two uh, was the high risk individuals that uh, 18 to 64 uh, with comorbidities and then individuals greater than 65. Um, the tier three uh, in Missouri is where the child care providers and uh, educators are included in the process. They're defined as a part of the critical infrastructure. So we're thinking that the tier three is likely going to be uh, the end of February, 1st of March in Missouri. Um, the, the challenge has been that sometimes the policy changes at the state level have not been communicated uh, with the local jurisdictions before the action is taken. So we're working to improve those communications through advocacy with both states 
to help us uh, better uh, present the information as uh, those changes occur. Uh, in Missouri, we uh, have phase two, which uh, is influenced uh, by supporting economic recovery, uh, disproportionately affected populations and the homeless in our uh, state. Uh, the reason they've included homeless uh, in this phase is that uh, sometimes uh, they uh, have uh, created some challenges um, in being able to identify those populations and then align them with the uh, jurisdictions to receive services. Sometimes they could be uh, engaged in congregate settings uh, when they seek shelter, but sometimes uh, they, uh, because of other related issues, uh, they uh, are considered that vulnerable population that we're trying to address them with other congregate setting environments within the state. As Missouri changes to phase three, again, they're thinking that'll probably be in the June timeline. Uh, that'll make the vaccine available more broadly to all um, residents uh, within the state. Next slide, please. So the communications, uh, while we know that there's gonna be uh, some prolonged vaccination efforts, it's important for us to make sure that everybody maintains proactive, or excuse me, protective actions uh, and get tested regularly. Uh, this is important just because uh, we uh, are, because we have vaccine available doesn't mean our level of risk is reduced yet. And so it's important to continue to wear a mask, to, uh, limit social uh, gatherings, uh, maintain social distancing, good hygiene practices, uh, just because the vax or the virus is still active uh, in our societies. Uh, the other important part of the process, sometimes people think that after they receive the vaccine uh, that they are protected and they don't need to wear uh, a mask or uh, take some of these precautions. It takes time for our bodies to build immunity and it takes time for us to have enough protection across society uh, to be protected. So uh, the messaging is that everybody still needs to follow these precautions. Uh, the next messaging that becomes important is uh, the communication about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine and the importance of this uh, vaccination effort being helpful to our community's ability to recover both economically and getting our students back into schools. Uh, we need to be able to make sure that we have that trust uh, in the vaccination effort as we're moving forward uh, so that we can try and return to uh, somewhat normal uh, life and society uh, in the future. Uh, the, the last messaging, which is I hope something I've conveyed through the discussion this evening, is that we need to be ready uh, for the vaccine when uh, we have the opportunity to uh, be vaccinated. Sign up when, there's, uh, when you're offered an opportunity to sign up. And uh, again, be patient. If it takes longer for you to receive the vaccine uh, than you're expecting. Uh, again, uh, they're uh, making the vaccine available as the allocation is allotted to the states. We anticipate that it, the allotment will continue to grow and the opportunity to receive that vaccine will continue to grow. Next slide, please. So some more uh, uh, links for you. Uh, again, the links to be able to see information from the CDC, from the state of Missouri and the state of Kansas. Their health departments, again, are uh, great resources to be able to make sure that you have accurate information, be able to uh, broadly identify the groups uh, that are eligible to receive the vaccine currently, and then also to dispel any rumors that are occurring about the vaccination effort. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation uh, and I'll uh, be happy to address any questions that are read from chat if uh, Carol would like to pose those. All right. Um, so Dan, is um, do we know if there is any proof needed um, that we work in the field? Um, 
the provider that uh, you're uh, receiving the vaccine through will have you complete a consent and a screening form. The screening form could identify uh, that you meet the criteria uh, to be able to receive the vaccine. It will also identify uh, things that may exclude you from receiving the vaccine. And so an example of that, there would be some questioning about whether or not you've had COVID uh, and they would ask the time frame in which you had COVID. Uh, if you are less than 14 days uh, from testing positive uh, with COVID, most of the uh, vaccine providers will not administer uh, the vaccine within that threshold. The CDC talks about uh, 90 days being a window to evaluate. It's not an absolute uh, uh, restriction, but they say that you should have antibodies in your system up to that 90 day period and that you, uh, the person receiving the vaccine would likely have lesser uh, side effects uh, if they receive the vaccine within that, uh, beyond that window. Another question, Dan, is uh, do, does the person receiving the vaccination get to choose which pharmaceutical, uh, which, which vaccine they receive? Uh, that's a question to present uh, to the provider when you're in, uh, registering to receive the vaccine. Um, the providers have different vaccines available to them so they can tell you which vaccine they have. Um, some vaccinators uh, have both vaccines available, depending on the type of uh, service they provide. Uh, so that would uh, you uh, through communication with the provider, you can identify which vaccine is available. And if you have a preference, you could determine when uh, which provider you wanted to receive the vaccine through. Okay, we have received um, quite a number of, of additional um, questions in the chat and um, some submitted previously, but we want to be respectful of time. So Dan, I'm going to thank you and turn it back over to Jenny for wrap up. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Agreed, Dan. I feel like I have a very thorough knowledge set now of how vaccines even came to be and that is all really helpful um, so thank you for taking the time to put that together I've seen all kinds of individual questions um, some that apply to all some that are very individual but know that we're going to work to summarize all of this um, even if it's specific to you, we want you to know, um, we want to hear that from you. Those are the questions we want to help get answered. So once we summarize this, we'll be working on putting the um, FAQ together and sending that out. And so um, we will stay on here for a few moments. So if you haven't got your question into the chat, please go ahead and do that. And if you already have and are ready to get on with your evening, um, I just want to say thank you for coming. Thank for all the hard work that you do and uh, for the impact that you have on our community. So thanks for coming out tonight. We'll see you soon.